Well, welcome back to the Senate Doctor Show. I'm uh, John Barrasso, an orthopedic surgeon from Casper, Wyoming, uh, as well as one of two physicians who serve in the United States Senate. And uh, for the last number of months, we've been doing the Senate Doctor Show as a chance to answer questions, uh, talk about the health care legislation as we're taking a look at uh, health care reform. The uh, big day today in the Senate, the Senate Finance Committee, uh, had a positive vote on their bill, which is still quite different from the bill that passed the HELP Committee uh, earlier this summer. Now those two bills need to be blended together, stitched together, if you will, and we'll see how that turns out over the next couple of weeks and then on to the Senate floor to debate the most important issue, in, in, in my opinion, that the Senate has dealt with in years and years because this is something that affects each one of us personally. Uh, there has never been a piece of legislation to this degree that affects every person individually, personally. It's a matter of our health and it's what matters to us for, our, for ourselves and for our family, for our kids, and, and how to pay for this and how to deal with it and how to do it in a way that we can actually improve health care because I will tell you there is a right way to do the right thing and there is a wrong way to do the right thing. But there's overwhelming agreement we need some for form of health care reform, insurance reform, uh, but I don't believe that a government takeover of health care is the right answer. So I'll be joined in a little bit by Senator Tom Coburn, the other physician in the Senate. He's from Oklahoma. He's actually on the Senate floor uh, right now debating an, an amendment to a bill. I hope that he will join us soon, but we try to go on live every Tuesday and Thursday at 5 o'clock Eastern time uh, in an effort to be able to answer your questions. We do man on the street interviews outside the Capitol. Uh, we get emails, Facebook questions, uh, questions on Twitter, and uh, and it's the best we can do is just to try to answer your questions and answer your concerns. Uh, so with that, we have a, uh, a video question coming in from North Carolina. Well, from a nursing standpoint, how is the new proposed health care plan going to affect students that are going in to become doctors and nurses? That's what I would like to know. Well, I appreciate your question, Ann. And if you're if you're a nurse, uh, the uh, I had the same question asked to me yesterday at the Wyoming Medical Center. I went into the hospital where I'd practiced for 25 years, had been chief of staff, uh, just to listen to nurses and techs and physicians and. Uh, primarily to patients to see what their concerns were. But from the nursing standpoint, but for all health professionals, we need more. Modern medicine has done a remarkable job of helping people live longer. But as a result, we have people that need more help health care providers. We need more doctors, we need more nurses, we need more physician assistants, more nurse practitioners. And uh, the question is, will that actually be dealt with in this bill? And I don't think it does an adequate job. Uh, the states are doing a better job, I believe. In, in Wyoming, we have a program set aside where there's money set aside to help nurses uh, with their uh, financing and their tuition. And then as a result, they stay in the state and practice. A lot of states have gone to that approach. Uh, so uh, forgiveness of scholarships is a good way to encourage people to, to enter the profession. Uh, nurses will tell you right now, and you probably know this, that they're spending more time with the computer than they are with the patient. And they're not happy with all the paperwork. And I think this is going to mandate a lot more paperwork for, for uh, all of the health care providers. So I want to do all I can to, to encourage and, and give the incentives for people to go into the health care profession uh, because we need all these health care providers. Somebody's going to need to take care of us as we get older. Uh, I'm not con I am not convinced that this is being done properly right now. I don't think they're doing it well enough with family physicians. Uh, they're trying to give some incentives for family physicians, but at the to me, I think it's, going, it's, uh, it's, it's not enough, and we need more to get more, more people going into primary care, primary medicine, because that's really what the patients need right now. Uh, we have an abundance of specialties, sometimes maldistribution of specialists, uh, but we need to do more than we're doing right now. Anyway, thanks so much for the question, and if you would like to ask us a question, all you need to do is email us at uh, doctors at src.senate.gov or leave questions at youtube.com slash user slash Senate Doctor Show. Facebook.com slash Senate Doctor Show, Twitter.com slash Senate Doctors. Um, now we have a, uh, a Twitter question coming in. Let's see. Here it is. Senate Doctors, are there provisions to allow purchase across state lines? Can individuals pool like companies? Tax credits for purchase? Well, uh, Dawn, the, uh, the, the, the three questions you ask uh, are ones that I think ought to be in included in any sort of a uh, health care proposal. I think that we actually ought to be allowed to help people buy insurance, make it easier for them. And one of the ways to do that is to allow them to buy insurance across state lines. The, uh, you know, you think about that and you say, why is it that you can't do that? You can buy automobile insurance across state lines. You should be able to provide, to buy uh, health insurance across state lines. 
And then I think that people that are buying their own health insurance policies, who are paying for it themselves, uh, not getting it through work, I think those folks ought to get the exact same tax relief that the big companies do. I mean, why should we treat people differently in that regard. So I think if there was more competition, you'd have people shopping around, paying, focused on how much it's going to cost them personally, making the decisions, and then, then making the right decisions that's best for them, best for their family. I mean, they know what their own situation is. And then giving them those same tax uh, incentives and, and tax relief. You asked, also asked the question, can individuals pool like companies? Well, right now, Small businesses can't pool either. And I think we need to give those incentives for small companies to be able to pool, uh, to get together, to get a better, a better uh, deal when it comes to their own uh, effective, cost-effective health care proposals. But, uh, you know, I just finished uh, an interview and people say to me, what, you know, what, what really, what, 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 we, what should we do? And I said, well, number one is we ought to allow uh, people to buy across state lines, which was your question, give them the same tax relief. The other is I think it ought to be patient-centered, focused on wellness, giving people incentives to stay healthy and keep down the cost of their care. And I think you need to d deal with all these abusive lawsuits are out there. And finally, let, let small companies, small businesses join together uh, to, uh, to get a, a uh, effective cost, effective way uh, to buy insurance, and that's the way to keep costs down. I don't think that a government run and a, and a government forced uh, insurance plan are the ones that, that the American people are going to want for themselves and their families. Well, now we have a um, man in the street interview question coming in from uh, David from Indianapolis. Uh, I'm David McMasters from Indianapolis, Indiana, and I'm just wondering whether our politicians are looking at the post office, the VA, uh, Social Security, and other programs that uh, they've messed up, they can't run, and they're turning around wanting to control my health care, which I believe is unconstitutional. And uh, I don't think they can give me a rational answer. And I'd like to know who's going to pay for it. Well, uh, great questions. I mean, you talk about the constitutionality of this. You talk about who's going to pay for it. You take a look at uh, what's happened with, uh, with the post office, Social Security, other programs, uh, and you say, what is the, uh, the effect of all of this? And, you know, you say, what has the government run well? And uh, for those people who want a government-run health insurance program, I'd say, well, look at the, the two government-run programs that we have now, Medicare and Medicaid. And Medicare, a program that uh, for our seniors, you know, it is, uh, it is going bankrupt. It's going to be bankrupt in the year 2017. Uh, it's an insur it really an insurmountable amount of debt. It's a wall of debt that we're looking at. Social Security, significant financial problems as well. So if you take a look at this and say, how is this all playing out? It is, uh, it is a government that is spending a lot of money, and it's not just your money, my money, it's our kids' money. I mean, that's the problem with all of this, that we are putting a debt on our children and grandchildren that they are going to have to, through the rest of their lives, pay. So I have great concerns when the government says we can do it better because I think the government's full of doublespeak. I don't think they do it right. Uh, and, you know, they say, how's this going to work? They're talking about $500 billion, $500 billion of cuts in Medicare, the program that our, that our families and seniors rely upon. So you take a look at that Medicare money, and they say, well, well, it won't cut services. How can you cut $500 billion out of Medicare and not affect the health care services for our seniors? So again, it's, it's double speak out of Washington. And then $400 billion of tax increases. Uh, you know, the American people, I believe, the ones I talk to, don't want to stand for this. They don't want this thing steamrolled through. Very offended by it. And you talked about the constitutionality of making this mandatory. I mean, you really are talking about government-forced insurance forcing everyone to buy insurance. And, uh, and that, is that, where is that in the Constitution? As you said, it sounds unconstitutional. Many states are now dealing legislatively with this by saying, you know, I don't care what Washington does. We want in our state, we don't want this to apply here. And I think about a dozen states or so uh, have looked at that as well. So, I mean, you got it right. You say, who's going to pay for it? The American people are going to end up paying for it. And my biggest concern with the Medicare cuts for people who depend on Medicare for their health care is they're going to cut $500 billion. But you know what? They're not using the money to save Medicare. They're using it to start a whole new government program. And, you know, when the president says, if you like your insurance, you can keep it. 
Well, not if you're on Medicare Advantage because he's gutted that whole program. He said, no, that has to go away. Well, we have 11 million Americans, seniors, who have relied on Medicare Advantage. And I've practiced medicine for 25 years, and I'll tell you, the thing, the difference between Medicare and Medicare Advantage is Medicare Advantage actually does some things to help coordinate care, to help with prevention, to help take care of, uh, of eye care, dental care. Medicare doesn't do any of those things. I've run the Wyoming health fairs for over 25 years, doing blood tests for people, helping people stay healthy. Lots of businesses, and even this, our home state, will pay for those preventive blood testing and, and early detection blood screenings. Medicare won't. They say, oh no, that has to do with, with prevention and screening. But boy, if you, get, you, know, you get, get a little dizzy or you have a symptom, then Medicare will pay lots and lots of money for blood tests. But they won't do it as a matter of trying to find a problem early detect a problem early, and then treat it when we know we can still treat it most effectively as well as uh, in an inexpensive way. So you got it absolutely right. Thanks for the question. Now we have a Twitter question coming in. Let's see. Um, Senate GOPs, why don't we expand Medicare to cover those without insurance? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting question to, about how one expands Medicare to cover more and more people when we know right now Medicare is one of the poorest payers. It doesn't even pay for the cost of the treatment that people receive. And that's why for people that have other insurance, they end up paying a little more because their money is going for themselves as well as for the, the, the bill that Medicare doesn't pay. Uh, when it comes to being a deadbeat payer, the, Washington is the biggest deadbeat of all. And they do it with Medicare, they do it with Medicaid, and then they force a lot of the Medicaid the, uh, for people who need that program onto the states, and it's going to bankrupt the states. Now, the thing with Medicare is that you say, what, how, do you, how do you continue to expand this program? Well, they have so much waste and fraud and abuse in Medicare. I think we ought to get that under control before we think about any expansion of the program. The president talks about all this money that can be saved. Well, let's save it today. You can save that money today. But there have been stories recently, and one in even my hometown paper this past weekend, that the drug dealers in Florida and the mafia and organized crime has gone into Medicare fraud. So why would they go into Medicare fraud in terms of, the, in terms of what they choose to do? Well, number one, less chance of getting caught as opposed to dealing drugs. Number two, if you get caught, the penalty is less. And number three, the profit is higher. So, I mean, if you look at a system like that, where convicted felons, murderers, can get out of jail and apply and get a Medicare number to provide Medicare services, and then go steal the identity of either doctors or patients to, to take advantage of a system that does a very poor job of policing itself, you say, let's get, this, let's get Medicare fixed right for the people that are on it right now before expanding it to cover others. If you'd like to have a question, to send a question, you can just email us at doctors at src.senate.gov or uh, just like that Twitter question, twitter.com slash Senate Doctors. Uh, now we have a, uh, a Twitter question coming in. Uh, Senate Doctors, will doctors be mandated to accept patients with a public plan or government option? If they are, uh, what about their freedoms? I don't know that that's been clearly uh, outlined. You know, there are a number of different bills. One has passed uh, a number of committees in the House, been through three different House committees. And then there are two different bills uh, in the Senate uh, through two different committees. And now those two bills have to be stitched together. And I know I want to be able to read the bill, just like everyone at home. We want to be able to read the bill. The, uh, the stitching job hasn't begun yet. They say it's going to take a week or so. The, uh, and then it's a matter of to take a look what's out there. And I think all of America ought to have at least 72 hours to look at the bill uh, and to think about it. Because, you know, the best ideas come from back home. That's why I go home for, uh, every weekend. I was in Wyoming earlier this morning. Uh, and, and you want to listen to people and hear what they have to say at home. Washington doesn't have the answers. The answers come from, 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 from back home. So I want everybody to have 72 hours to read the bill, and then I want to know what it's going to cost. And I really, because you've got to be able to take a look at this and say, how much money is this going to cost? What we know right now is it's going to be a trillion dollar bill. 
and it's going to be about $500 billion of cuts from Medicare, $400 billion in tax increases, but yet it doesn't deal with a number of things that I think are important because there's a right way and a wrong way to deal with this problem. We have a problem, we need health care reform, but what we're looking at right now isn't the right answer. And when it comes to whether doctors are going to be mandated to accept patients or doctors are going to be forced to do procedures that they may not want to do, uh, you know, I have great concerns about that and I'm going to make sure that doctors are not forced to do things that they don't want to do um, because that's not the way that this country was built. That's not the things that we believe in. You know, you say where in the Constitution is that going to apply? But uh, I have heard from doctors all around the country that said, am I going to have to do this? Am I going to have to be part of this program? And you may have seen some of those studies that said up to 45 percent of doctors who can retire will retire if, uh, if this uh, government plan comes to place. Uh, now we have a video question coming in from uh, Seattle, Washington. I'd like to know why the Republicans seem so dead set against single payer and they aren't even willing to settle for the uh, public option. Well, they have a single payer plan in Canada, single player payer plan in, uh, in, in England, a number of places around the world. And you say, is, that a, is it a good system or is it a bad system? Uh, and, and I look at it and say, is it good for patients or is it bad for patients? And, and in both of those countries, for about 70 percent of the people, it's okay. But if you're really sick, if you're really sick, and I've seen this in, in where patients come from Canada to the United States for their care, the, uh, a single payer system is a very bad system. In, uh, in Calgary, in Canada, because of budget concerns, all of a sudden they said, oh, we're going to pay for 2,000 fewer cataract operations. Single payer system, the single payer says, we don't want to pay for that. As a result, what happens to people that need cataract operations? They get to wait and wait. And then what happens if they're going blind? That's the only time that they are able to have the operation. But if they have money, they come to the United States to get their care. When a big supporter of the British of the uh, Canadian health care system uh, developed cancer and she's a member of their of their parliament, what did she decide to do? Come to the United States for her care. People in Canada routinely come to the United States for care because they tire, they're tired of waiting for their care. In a single payer system, the single payer can at any time for a budgetary reason say, no, we're not going to pay for that. There absolutely is rationing of care. It means waiting and uh, waiting a long period of time. As they say in Canada, they call it trick-or-treat medicine because they start their budget year January 1st. And the reason they call it trick-or-treat medicine is because if you are uh, really haven't had your operation by around October 31st by Halloween, well, then you're out of luck because the system has run out of money and they stopped doing the operations. So for people waiting for a hip replacement, um, if, thank, if uh, Halloween comes along, you haven't had the operation, well, just wait until January 1st and then you get in line again. And that's the system, what, that's what you see with a single payer system. They decide what the budget is rather than what the needs of the people are. But thanks for the question. Uh, now we have another question uh, coming in from, uh, I think, California, from Cheryl. Is Obama now going to come out with a specific plan so that everybody can vote yes or no on it? Well, I'm not sure. I haven't seen one yet, Cheryl. You know, he came to the, the president came to Congress and talked about what was important uh, to him. And, you know, he said, if you like your uh, insurance, uh, you get to keep it. But he also said, you know, but if you're on Medicare Advantage, no, you can't keep that. So, you know, you say, well, what is he really saying there? Uh, he's saying this won't cost a single dime. Uh, you know, I think people all around the country know that this is going to cost a lot of money. And when you ask people, do you think that it's going to cost you money personally? They say yes. And if you ask them, do you think that your health care is going to be better as a result of the fact that you're paying more money? Then the answer there is no. And Americans don't want that. They want value for their money. Uh, and just this past weekend, there was a, a study uh, that came out that said for people that have their own insurance right now, if you have your own insurance, uh, and if this all passes, that you will actually personally be paying more, more for your insurance than if nothing passed, that your personal insurance costs will go up more than if nothing has passed. Well, the, the whole idea be, behind all of this was to help keep costs under control 
to help American families, to help them keep the cost of their care down. And now what we're looking at is government forced insurance, uh, government, uh, government uh, run insurance, uh, all and, uh, and an incredible amount of cuts to Medicare that helps, our pa helps our, my patients when I took care of them, but helps all of our seniors um, and with a huge increase in taxes. So, yeah, I guess you can always say, well, we're going to be uh, uh, deficit neutral, which I think is what Senator Baucus said today. Well, if you're willing to raise taxes enough and cut Medicare enough, then I guess you can, you can claim that. But that's not what the American people want. We don't want Washington playing these games with our lives and our health care. Well, with that, um, I'm sorry Senator Coburn didn't get to talk with us today and answer some of your questions. Uh, I'm sure we'll be back Thursday at... Um, at five o'clock and uh, hopefully be joined by Senator Tom Coburn again at that time. But uh, thanks so very much for once again being part of the Senate Doctors.